My name is Paul Huddleston. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here at Mayo Clinic. I practice spine surgery in the Department of Orthopedics. Uh, I work with other partners also in uh, the Department of Neurosurgery and together we take care of a lot of the spine injuries and the spinal cord injuries that result from that here uh, in the winter season. One of our jobs here as a level one trauma center is to take care of the whole gamut of people that are injured. As you can imagine during the winter months with the frequency or increased frequency of small mobile injuries or motor vehicle accidents, uh, that uh, the whole patient can be injured. And one of the parts that uh, gets the most attention uh, can be the spinal cord. If you're paralyzed, it's hard to imagine the rest of your life going forward. It's such a traumatic event. Uh, the management of that can be very complicated, and we're fortunate enough here to work with a multidisciplinary team to try to manage that. So fortunately, we're part of a level one trauma center. We work with the helicopter crew here to get patients here to Mayo as quickly as possible. A lot of times with our uh, increasing uh, regional network, our, our spread, or working with other regional hospitals, uh, we're able to receive people from outside hospitals, people that were not seen and evaluated initially here at, at Mayo Clinic. And that's fine too. Uh, we have uh, had a good working relationship and we'd like to be a good resource for, for people who uh, are trying to manage that multiply traumatized patient with a spinal cord injury. One of the more common questions that people ask about is, is do you do this often? Is there a lot of, is this seen very often at the clinic or do you have a lot of experience in this? I personally take care of uh, over a dozen at least of these a year. I have five other partners in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery who see uh, at least as much as I do, plus another six or so partners in neurosurgery. So together we see well over a hundred of these cases each year. And they, they're not always as dramatic as, a, as what we were talked about before. I mean, that's the most obvious thing when someone's paralyzed and they can't move anything at all. Um, but there are varying degrees of that. Sometimes it's just a slip on the ice where you're shoveling the driveway and people can sustain a partial spinal cord injury. Either way, we have the, uh, uh, again, a multidisciplinary group here of physiatrists, PM&R doctors who are specializing in uh, spinal cord rehab, neurologists, uh, the trauma surgeons themselves uh, uh, that uh, specialize in any other injuries that might have happened during the accident, neurosurgery team with neurosurgeons uh, to uh, address any intracranial or cranial injuries in addition to spinal cord uh, problems, and the orthopedic spine surgeons who have uh, expertise in the bones and joints and stabilizing the spine. One of the controversial things that uh, in, the, in my mind in the last 10 years that's evolved with spinal cord injury is the use of steroids. Uh, while this is a, a, a truly a moving target, my own personal opinion is that I'm, I'm no longer convinced that, uh, that we absolutely have to give steroids to patients with the spinal cord injuries. This is probably the most common call we receive from one of our outside hospitals or our regional partners in, in caring for someone with a spinal cord injury. Should I give steroids? What's the dose? Uh, is it too late to give the steroids? I think what we've done here in, in Rochester is a multidisciplinary trauma group. We've talked about this in the past several years and come to a, uh, an order set and a guideline that we use here to uh, try to organize and streamline this care. Instead of defaulting automatically to the, what historically used to be give the IV bolus of steroid medication to try to uh, prevent any worsening of the spinal cord injury, we've actually defaulted out of that. That is, the surgeons uh, can, they have to initiate the order to give it instead of it automatically happening. And this is predominantly for, for three concerns, to address three concerns. The first being that there's very clearly morbidity associated with the administration of these high dose of IV steroids and there's no true dramatic demonstrable benefit. So we get increased, we know we see an increased infection rate, we see uh, increased problems with the stress doses of the steroids such as gastritis and we certainly see decreased uh, ability in the patient or the host to heal the wounds either sustained from the trauma or the ones that we've applied to them to try to help them get well with surgery or, uh, or otherwise. So uh, again, that is truly the most controversial thing that I think is in, in, uh, in the care of these uh, multiply injured spinal cord injury patients and the, the solitary spinal cord injury patients. That is the number one question. 
uh, should I give the steroids? We've opted out of that as a standard. Uh, I personally think that as a physician or a caregiver, it's up to you at the point of, uh, of contact to make that decision. We're not going to second guess you, but uh, just to describe or tell you a little bit of our practice, if you, you're seen here, you're defaulted out of it. That means we have to volitionally make the choice to give it because of our concerns that I said before. Risk of infection, uh, complications with the stress doses of the steroids, and uh, poor wound healing or, or bone healing after giving such a high dose of, of that medication. One of the other things that we've kind of centered around is important to us in the care of spinal cord injury patients is to get them to the operating room as soon as possible. Um, if we're not giving steroids, if we don't believe that that is an effective treatment at preventing or uh, the propagation of a spinal cord injury or minimizing the severity that's, that's present at the time of the accident, uh, we want to get you treated and stabilized and moving as soon as possible. Every day that you're lying in bed, you're at risk for bed sores, pneumonia, blood clots, any of the various and many morbidities that are, any patient can experience by coming into the hospital. So we want to get you moving as soon as possible, um, whether that's involving minimally invasive surgery or what you and I would know as a, a more standard operation with uh, larger incisions. Uh, I'm not sure that that's as important as the actual intervention itself. Fortunately, we have two staff spine surgeons on call here at Mayo Clinic every day. Uh, that means if one of the spine surgeons is unable or overwhelmed with a, a uh, national or, or a disaster or a, a multiple polytraumas, multiple patients, we do have two full-time staff, full staff doctors, a staff neurosurgeon and a staff orthopedic surgeon to address any sort of uh, spinal emergencies. And one of the exciting things in uh, helping care for and treating spinal cord injury patients is the possibility that out there in the future there might be some hope for what is even in the medical field thought of as a catastrophic injury, the permanent loss of, of arm or leg function. For, as you're well aware, uh, most of an adult young male's lifetime. Um, certainly these happen to uh, females also and older patients, but really the, the tragedy here is that most of these patients are younger, uh, active, and they have all lost potentially all the potential of, of a working life. They might be on disability for the remainder of their 50, 60 years. One of my partners is uh, involved in uh, some very elegant and advanced spinal cord injury research. Dr. Michael Yazemski, uh, our division chair in the Department of Orthopedics and the Division of Spine Surgery, uh, is involved with working with uh, one of the neuroscience uh, researchers, Dr. Tony Windebank, and with the neurosurgery colleagues, uh, Dr. Richard Marsh and others, uh, to advance the spinal cord injury regeneration. Uh, Dr. Yazemski is a polymer chemist. He's an engineer. Uh, by training, um, an MD, PhD, and uh, is, has several funded NIH grants and is working with the Department of Defense actually in tissue regeneration. His particular basic science interest is in polymer chemistry, so basically uh, synthetic chemicals, manufactured chemicals that uh, can dissolve at different rates in the body. For example, we can make uh, polymers tubing on a micro level, that means uh, imagine a spinal cord injury with a defect of uh, a centimeter or two where the actual injury really traumatized or crushed or severed the spinal cord. We can model in animals now, in uh, animal research, uh, the manufacture of a conduit or a tube plus the uh, uh, addition of uh, growth chemicals such as uh, nerve growth elements uh, to try to not only provide a pathway for the nerves to regenerate from one injured, the uninjured side of the, or the proximal side of the spinal cord injury to the distal injury, but also encourage them to grow in the right fashion and manner to hook up with the other sides that were to provide the most effective recovery. Now this is uh, basic science research. It's in an uh, advanced basic science stage, and we haven't made the complete translation to humans, but this is cutting edge stuff, and, uh, and we're very excited to be a part of it, and very excited to have a representative who is uh, really leading this edge of the field uh, with that, multi again, that the strength of that multidisciplinary group of orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, neuroscientists, uh, and all working together.